All right, navigating web soil survey and um, the reclamation suitability tool. So what do we got going on here? Let's take a look. So the case for why, um, oh, it was September, 2017, Miranda and Tom came to myself and Mark Hayek and Lance Dewey on my staff and, and asked for some, some strategies to, to uh, help um, improve reclamation processes on, on these pipeline corridors and so on. So anyway, li little be notes to them. I've been, been toying with this idea of, of putting together a tool, uh, an interpretation like this for over, over 20 years. So in, in, in Montana as a data quality specialist, I, I worked with Mike Hansen and we, we put together a version of it for Montana. But this one here, I think is a little more robust and I'm a, I'm a little more happy with the results that we see there. You know, and so um, industry was coming to them with looking for those those uh, answers to the questions, and then and ultimately our, our landowners, our land managers, our land renters are are all going to benefit from 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 having this knowledge up front. And so a lot of a lot of caveats that come along with that. What are issues are cost and feasibility as you go along a corridor like that, and you move from land position to position on the landform. You're moving from ecological site to ecological site. And, and each each one of those has its own set of unique species. And so it, 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 that would be a unique mix and so on and all kinds of complication in, in designing a, a successful or a potentially successful seed mix for that corridor, especially with the size of the equipment that we're using. So it's just plain not practical, it's expensive. And then, then you know, that's not even accounting for the fact that we have all of the establishment issues that we have in the, in, in the, the dry climate that we have here. So we're working with, uh, in Western North Dakota, some of the most highly erosive, fragile soils in the country. Um, you know, and, and the, the number, the biggest biggest uh, limitations being that, that low precipitation that we get in those steep slopes. And, and it's just those, those, those uh, marine deposits are, are full of sodium, uh, chloride, sulfate salts, and what have you. And then you add the complexity of some of our lower water receiving wet areas and, and, the, and the opportunity for salinization from evaporation there, um, establishment issues when, when, you're, when we're inundated and, and saturated, along with all of the equipment limitations that comes, comes along with, uh, with uh, dealing with wet areas too. So um, all kinds of fun. And so how can we... Uh, um, increase our success. And so uh, I've always been told if you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So we got to do a little bit of planning, get up front, get out front of this thing to, if we expect to succeed. And so some of my ideas and strategies when we started visiting about this is that I knew um, from my background working with the National Soil Information System um, and web soil, the data that's in web soil survey that, that we, we can identify those problem areas and avoid them, either work around them or use technology to go under them and, or, and, and avoid the, the, those areas where we, ex, we expect to fail and, and focus our efforts on those areas where we can have successes. And so along with that, if we implement that, that, that effective site management strategy um, before we ever uh, lay one piece of equipment on the ground, uh, plan to uh, separate that topsoil from the subsoil, we know that works. Um, go after it with a strategy where we minimize that surface disturbance, um, minimize the, the compaction that comes along with it. And, and there, you know, as you look across the, the state there, or even the, even the nation, there is, there is um, not one soil that isn't affected by water and wind erosion at some level. And so plan to use those practices, install those practices that minimize that, the mulch, the the erosion control mats, the fiber rolls, and you know, all of those things that are out there and around and technology, it, it continues to increase there. Um, and so that we can reduce that sediment, um, slow that runoff, reduce our soil losses, um, you know, and minimize surface pollution and, and also um, have lower impact on our wildlife habitat. So um, lots of things going on there. So what did we do? Um, so the first thing we did is we convened a panel of experts, whether it, it from from industry, um, from other federal agencies, there are researchers, NDSU, myself, other people on my staff or in my agency, and, and we sat down and we worked through the criteria. Sam, um, Sam Crow, she she put together a set of 
sites and we went through those one by one where there were either failures or, or successes and we went through them one by one identified the the reason it failed or or what the limitation of that site was for 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 the the end result and and come up with a list of, of those soil properties and qualities and, and set set the limits where where we expected it to form perform and not perform and so that was a big help that's where you start and so then I took that that information and I sat down in front of, of the the NASA's database National Soil Information System it's it's uh, the the motor behind web soil survey it's uh, the most robust national most robust natural resource database in the world. And so we can truly say that we're working with the world's best data set. We've got in a couple of years here, we'll have 125 years worth of data to support and, 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 and act as a backdrop to, to uh, support our, our, our decisions with. And so um, I sat down with that database and, and began to write a, a set of uh, SQL queries and, and, and put together the properties and evaluations and rules that, that would drive this interpretation. And this is kind of a visual model of what that looks like there. Um, it has uh, you know, three main rules and sub rules there. Uh, this, the, the contain site, site characteristics and, and the sub rules with that, physical soil properties and chemical soil properties. And it's, a, and it's an onion of sorts. And so each one of these green bars is a, is a, is a rule. And, and I've added multipliers. That's, that's for um, adjustments as, as we, we use it and watch it perform. And if we see it driving more on one level than, than another, we can make those adjustments. But it's easier for me to put those pieces in place before I need them than, than after the fact. So I don't have to tear it completely apart. And that and operator there is significant. What that tells me that I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the minimum value. And so what I've got here is each one of these rules is going to generate a, a numerical value for me. And when, when I use that AND operator, I'm going to use the lowest value and kick that forward as my, as my rating for, for the interpretation on that particular soil. And so as we peel the onion, we looked at site characteristics. And so, you know, these, these are the, the above ground things you see as you're standing on the ground slope. So we're looking at steepness, steepness, which is going to, you know, and, and your equipment limitations are all going to increase as that as slope gets steeper aspect. We're looking at uh, um, the difference in, in effective precip on, on the cool, um, cool aspects and north, northeast aspects versus the south, southwest aspects. And, and you're just always a, always a click dryer on those south aspects. Depth to seasonal high water table. Again, you're looking at equipment limitations and, and saturation, um, slowing your uh, opportunities for um, um, germination to, to occur and so on. Um, you know, ponding those water receiving areas, um, you know, after during spring runoff, during uh, um, uh, severe thunderstorms and so on, you know, you're going to pond for long, very long durations. Is it going to, will that water going to sit there long enough to impede um, um, the performance of those plants or not? Same thing with flooding. You, you put, put that fast moving water on the landscape and you have the opportunity to destroy all the work you've, you've put in to, to establish those practices or get them in place at least. And so, um, then the next thing we we're looking at is, is surface fragments, you know, you know, stones and boulders, you know, obviously we're going to limit our equipment when we, when we encounter those. So we want to uh, account for those areas on the landscape. And then aridity, we're looking at a climate piece here where, and these are those areas where um, evapotranspiration exceeds precipitation. So we're losing more water than we're receiving on those sites. It's going to make it more difficult for those plants to succeed. Um, when we're in that dry, arid, arid uh, climate. Um, moving on to our physical soil properties, you know, available water capacity, um, you know, how much of that, how much water can that profile hold and, and, and where are we at? You know, we know that, that when we hit that permanent wilting point, we're at 15 bar pressure, we're going to lose our plants. We know that um, when we get to that maximum allowable deficiency is usually at about 50% of that available water capacity, we start to see our warm season plants will, will uh, um, suffer a little bit or, or degrade in performance. And, and we also know that those cool season plants, those that come in, in early spring are just a little bit more sensitive. The, what I find in the literature is that that starts to, to uh, 
um, they start they start to be affected when we get that maximal allowable deficiency at about 40% of the available water. Um, and we looked at organic matter. Um, more organic matter you have, the more abil ability you have to hang on to that water and keep it in the profile. And that 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 organic matter will also add to your natural fertility. Um, and and uh, then we looked at clay content. That clay content is there for the simple reason. Um, it's sticky. It, and, and so that stickiness and will uh, muck up your, your equipment. And so it causes equipment limitations and, and workability of your site. Um, again, stones and boulders and cobble in the surface rather than laying on the surface are also something that we want to look at. And, and then we looked at that rooting depth, though depth to, to bedrock, whether it be hard or soft bedrock, or, or and, and we also looked at, at whether that parent material was sandy or not. Um, all of these physical and chemical properties that we looked at, we only looked to a depth of 30 centimeters, about one foot, um, looking at um, that depth where we're going to at least get that that plant a good start, get get a rooting system started, and and, and get it on get it on its get it on its way. Um, chemical soil properties: we looked at electrical conductivity, which is um, an indication of salinity. Most of us know that sodium absorption ratio. That presence of sodium is as a dis dispersive effect on the soil and, and it causes it to seal up, and so we want to pay attention to that. PH, we're looking at pH, and most of, the, of what we're looking at there is nutrient availability. So we want to find that ideal pH between 6.5 and 7.5, where we have the most nutrients available. And then we looked at calcium carbonate um, equivalent. And so calcium carbonate, it's a salt, is going to act as a desiccant, and, and it's going to uh, um, you know, raise your pH. And so we're looking at nutrient availability there. It also tends to coat the particles. And then when we're at the surface with that, that calcium carbonate, we're more susceptible to wind erosion. So we want to keep that in into account. And so this is, this is a you know, layer and we can dig into the, to the onion, another layer, layer deeper. And for each of these, these soil properties, we had to put together an evaluation. So how did, how did we handle that? And so I think we had all of this, just under 20 different soil properties and, and, and qualities that we evaluated. And so this is nothing more than a visual representation. We're, we're looking at slope here. I'll describe one of them and then we'll, we'll, we'll let you go hunt down and, and teach yourself about the other, the other uh, um, 15 or 20 of them or however many there are. Um, so what we're looking at there is, is, is we're saying that, that we are well suited with a slope that's less than or equal to 9%. So along the, the left margin here, we got numbers that range from zero to one. And so zero, um, we're absolutely not suited. And one, we are absolutely suited. And so when we say less than or equal to nine, our membership is 100%, we are well suited. And then, in, and then conversely, when we look at a slope that's greater than or equal to 15%, we say we are absolutely not suited and we give that a value of, of zero. And in between those two values, we have partial membership and we fall out along this line. The closer we are um, to, to zero, the more limited it is, the closer we are to one, the less limited it is on a, on a suitability like that. And so that's, that's the, the, the crux of the onion. There's a lot more of the querying language and stuff like that. No sense in, in putting that in front of you unless you wanna sit down and learn how to program. Most of that you will retain won't re retain anyway. So uh, we'll go go into that next. And so the, the show your work part of it, those of you that want to dig in and go find that stuff, this is just a screenshot of web soil survey. And, and as you get more familiar, um, whoops, we want to get back in there. And, and um, once you get an, a, a, an area of interest selected, if you go to the soil data explorer tab, and then to the the soil reports tab, um, come under area of interest, and there's a, a report in there that says, National soil interpretation um, um, description and criteria summary. And so you grab that report and then come down and select the interpretation you're looking at. In this case, reclamation suitability and, and put a checkbox in front of it that ND in parentheses doesn't mean anything other than the fact that that, that interpretation was programmed with North Dakota in mind. And so all of that stuff is put together by myself. At this point, I'm the only one in, in North Dakota that has the, the skill set to, to, to script these and put them together. Um, I'm 
be happy to teach you if you want to know, because that skill set needs to get passed on somewhere along the line. Um, but anyways, you run that report by by hitting that new soil report, and it'll generate this this uh, text document that I wrote, and and you can go in and pick apart all of the details um, that I just shared you about slope for each of those soil properties and qualities that we used in this interpretation, and 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 the logic and and uh, that was used for for each of those is is stated in there too. So then you can can uh, um, understand the science behind what we did here, and so. The beauty of, of doing something like this is that once I did acre one, I'm in a situation where I can do the other 54,250,000 acres in North Dakota in one in the press of a button. And so we know where we're limited and where we're not limited, where, we, where we're going to have success or more li most likely to have success and where we need to think, think real good and hard about what we're doing before we do it. And, and and so that's that's kind of where we're at, what we've created. And it, it, it's fun to have that in place um, after thinking about it for 15 or 20 years and, and actually pulling it off. Now let's see if the next speakers will let me get closer to the computer here. I'm going to jump out of there and, and into uh, getting the crutches on here and, and, and into web soil survey and show you how to use some of these tools. Find your favorite browser and type in web soil survey. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's the top one. Just make sure it says nrcs.usda.gov in the URL there and give her a launch. Um, one yeah. secret is to close some of these windows behind you. They increase your performance. Um, pay attention to the start page. Those of you that haven't used it, there's lots of how to and, and, and find your way and, and you can teach yourself if you're patient. Um, and, and I won't belabor that. Most people just whack that start your soil survey button and go after it. And we're in. So as it draws, there's several ways to go after your, your uh, area of interest. Those of you that are more advanced with, with GIS, you can import a shape file. And so those of you that have multiple part multiple polygon um, areas of interest that allow you to bring that in as a shape file rather than draw your one one uninventive rectangle around what you're looking at. There's other other things like the lat long, which is just a point, the public land survey system, which is going to get you to your favorite section in the world. And I typically use the uh, um, the soil survey area. And so I'm going to just jump in there, grab North Dakota. Yeah, we'll take you on a tour of Dunn County today. Hit the radial button, and then I'm going to hit set the AOI right there, and uh, it'll it'll draw all of Dunn County out for me. So uh, another thing that you can can do if you want is you can use these tools right here in the end, the uh, the AOI tools to to draw a small polygon and and just worry about that part of the world that you're in if you want to. Um, once we're there. Um, you know, you can go to that soil map tab and, and, and you get a feel for this, the symbols, the map unit descriptions and, and how much of the area um, each map unit has. Each of these map unit names is linked to a map unit description. So you can go in there and learn more about the composition and landforms that things are on and everything. But um, to save you some time, I'm going to go back, back to that area of interest tab. And, and uh, the quickest way to find what you're looking for is to use this handy dandy search engine. All you got to do is in my case, know how to spell a little bit. And so we'll type in reclamation. Suitability. And hit return. And there we go. We come up with that outline there. And, and the, the thing about that outline is each one of those, those bold things there are, are going to correspond to a tab in, in the database. And so it tells you where you don't have a match and where you do have a match. I'm going to jump down to uh, the suitabilities and limitations. Just click on the, this one here, and I'll find a hyperlink that if I click on it, it'll jump me right to that part of WebSoil Survey that I want to use the most. Um, several other ways to navigate through there. You can click on the individual tabs and, and find your way through that. Um, it's relatively intuitive. Um, but um, if you aren't familiar with it, it's handier to, to find your way through there. And so what we've got here, I'm going to 
keep this from, from uh, expanding and tuck that up a little bit. So under land management, we've got our limitations and suitability. So there's a quick description. And for each interpretation that you run, you want to take and spend a little bit of time reading about the, how the values are. Some, some are designed as limitations where the low numbers are good and the bad, and high numbers are bad and, and vice versa. For a suitability, what we're looking at, high numbers are good, low numbers are bad. So pretty intuitive there. Um, so let's go ahead and we'll launch that, that and view the rating. Wait for it to draw. And there we have it. Um, there's a five color system. You click, click on the on that legend tab, it'll pop out and give you your your color color um, sequence. Um, of course, red is not suited. That dark green is well suited. And then I chose to divide the somewhat suited into three categories: moderately well suited, um, somewhat suited, and poorly suited because I felt like it had more meaning. And I broke those at at, at point. 9.6 and 0.3. So 0 to 0 0.3 is poorly suited. 0.3 to 6 is somewhat suited. And 0.6 to 0.9 are, are moderately well suited and so on. And as we move in, in on that, we can zoom in a little bit, let it draw. You can see that that, that has more meaning than if, if the orange and yellow and light green were all one, all yellow in there. You get a little more of a sensibility for, for, um, you know how much more useful it is when you when you when you have those five classes versus three. So there's a quick look at the map, um, and then we'll take a little bit of time here and understand the report. Moderately suited is our interpretation, um, but we've got two different things going on in this map. You know, site characteristics at 0.75. The most limiting one is is that uh, um, 0.68 there for soil physical properties. But you see that that, that low number only represents 5% of that map unit. We're looking at the dominant condition. So the dominant condition is the site characteristics driving it at that 0.75, which give us that moderately well suited. And so I got one more I'll explain to you that's it's a little, little more enlightening or, or maybe it's confusing, hopefully not that. So let's, let's take a look at this van. And a map unit. And what we see is that um, um, we got chemical soil properties, physical soil properties, and site characteristics firing out on these three components pretty regularly. But the only consistent one um, is, is that the, the chemical soil care properties are firing at zero or unsuited for all three of those components. And so that, that's your dumb condition there. Um, the physical characteristics are all there, but they're they're not all at zero. This one's at 0.6 and so on. But the thing to pay attention to though, and do a little bit of math, and you'll find that that's only only 79% of that map unit. There's where's the other 21%? Anything that rates a one or well suited isn't going to show up in this table. So we've got 79% of our map unit that's unsuited, but there's still 21% of it that's suited or usable. So you want to take some time, get to know those data, understand your, your situation and go after that. Um, and, and it takes a little patience, a little bit of time, but, but it, it is definitely doable. And so also as you're doing that, um, take the time um, as you're going through and working through a web soil survey, you can create a printable version of any map that you're looking at on the spot. It'll create a PDF document. You can save it to your computer and have it. Don't have to go back and redraw that map. Or as you're working through several interpretations in a session, you can add them to the shopping cart there. And then when you're done with your session, you can come over here to this shopping cart tab, pop that down, um, go in to, to the shopping cart, and it'll show you those, those, those sessions that sections that you saved. You can check them on or off, keep the ones you want, throw the ones you don't want, and download a version and, and have your own custom soil resource report. Um, don't try to print it. It was just to watch the trees pop right off the landscape if you hit print on those. So there's a lot of data in there. Um, let's jump into the soil reports tab. There's a couple of things to show you in there. How are we doing for time? Get a couple minutes. All right. I'm not gonna. So if you go into this component soil legend, 
check that include minor soils gets the full resolution of the database, not just the major components. And so what you'll see there is, is that you get the full resolution of, of the slopes of, of the composition of each map unit there. There's seven components in that map unit and, and, and that, and that their um, um, proportion. And your slope, this is the slope column here. I just I scrolled up too far, but it, it, it's got a low, a representative value and a high. All of our data elements have that clay, um, sand percent slope, and so our range is zero to 2% there, but our representative value is one. And so a lot of our interpretations are driven off of those representative values. And so there's a, there's a lot of resolution to these data too. So um, with that, um, our next steps are to take what we have here and go after those units that are less limited, that, that, aren't, that aren't poorly or, or unsuited and, and look at grouping those ecological sites that are assigned to those and, and do, a, do a better job of simplifying what needs to happen as far as creating seed mixes and, and, and make that more simple to, to use and, and help you work your way across a, a pipeline scar and have more success in that, in that uh, um, um, application there so i'm going to leave that right there and and uh and get a little bit of time for questions not much but uh has anybody got anything to ask brenda is there a, like a bad inclusion and a good map unit or a, what's what I said, or a good inclusion and a bad map is there a way to know you're on those small percentages yes the best way to know is to use that map unit description and figure out what position on the landform those those soils occur at and so it'll say on the back slope or on the foot slope on an escarpment or or, or where that position is and, and 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 get to know where you're at within the polygon um, and associate the individual components with the individual um, positions on the landform because that's that's the differences that we were recognizing and where those contrasting interpretations happen or why they're there. Yeah. 